Giving a bit of a shout out here for beginners, please. I mean, stop this video right now and go see the video, this video, this interview that was done with Sheldon Solomon just a couple of days ago. It's about five days ago, talking about death and meaning. It's such a great video. I, I can't say enough good things about it. It's a three hour video. It is, it is massive. And Sheldon is articulate and witty and very interesting. Can't say enough good things about that video. Uh, what I want to do today is sort of follow out I guess some of the riffs, I'm not going to talk about the video at all. I mean, go go watch it yourself. I'm not going to go talk about it. But it, it, it's, it's just so fortuitous that I just came across it today because I was thinking about shooting a video on psychoanalysis and politics and philosophy. So I want to see if I can just talk a little bit about psychoanalysis. And, you know, I, I want to give more on psychoanalysis and then see if I can get it into this discussion of, of politics and philosophy. Okay. When I say the word psychoanalysis, when I'm talking about the word psychoanalysis, or the, the practice of psychoanalysis, I'm largely thinking about Freud. And, you know, Freud's major insight is that consciousness is multi-layered, multifaceted, and that it has ego-gratifying defense mechanisms. That is, there are certain ways in which we serve what we take to be our self-interest by distortions, by selective omissions, by various psychological practices that I guess they make it so that a full transparency of self is, is very difficult, if not impossible. There's, people can be driven by motives of which they're unaware. And you know they can have very subtle influences on you, right? And so psychoanalysis largely is a practice by which people try to learn what might be some alternate motives to the ones that they consciously are entertaining as explanations for their behavior or their beliefs. Now, you know, some of this, you know, it's really interesting to get at Freud. You know, Freud gets so misunderstood, you know, he's popularly read. Freud's book, Totem and Taboo, is so interesting. I mean, it could be called, you know, what I learned from Sir George, Sir James George Frazier. You've ever seen Frazier's book, The Golden Bough? It, it's such a fascinating, fascinating collection. I, I think it was like in a book or two, and then it came out to a dozen. And then you can get now the compendium boiled back down into just in a single volume, you know, the, the original. But these amazing, now I think largely discredited and, and highly criticized as sort of suspicious forms of anthropology at the turn of the century, but <clears throat> mid, mid turn of the century, not turn of the century, somewhere around there. Uh, but I think, and again, Frank, please go get the golden bow in one volume. It's, it's so it's such a fascinating book. He lays out this whole theory of sympathetic magic, talking about magics of contagion and magics of similarity. At any rate, um, you know, I think what happened was Freud had read Frazier. And he had, he'd seen all these fascinating taboos across so many cultures. And then when he wrote T Totem and Taboo, and it's in other places as well, but I mean, you know, people popularly say, well, Freud's thesis is that, you know, you want to have sex with one parent and kill the other. I mean, sort of the, and you don't realize that that's what's really going on, but instead you're doing, you know, reason, you're doing, you know, various things out in your life, whether they're social accomplishments or forms of cruelty upon others, but they're really repressed desires for this, again, uh, what, what people wouldn't recognize in their conscious mind, you know, sort of the argument. But what happened was, I mean, Freud, as I said, he was, he was, he had studied Frazier and he had noticed a kind of cultural universal across all of these different peoples that Frazier had reported on, which were matricide, taboos, patricide taboos, and incest taboos. And from that, Freud kind of went, well, if, if there are explicitly or at least enacted practices and some, you know, superstitious belief systems around these, and there therefore were cultural taboos against doing it, well, then he, he reasoned, then people must have some sort of unconscious desire to do that. Right, so again, I don't, I don't think it sounds as crazy as it first seems. You know, in the sort of popular expression. Once you see how he got that from reading Fraser's work, at any rate, 
Uh, you know, when I'm thinking about psychoanalysis, though, it's it's not just the the formal applications of it by in Freud and in the way that you would do free association and dream analysis, and you'd have, lay on a couch, look the other way, and the person will ask you questions about you know how you were raised and. And, you know, do, do you have bedwetting or, you know, do you have other issues with, you know, how you were toilet trained? There's all these kinds of weird psychoanalytic stuff has to do with phases of development. I, I wasn't, I'm not really interested in that. I'm interested in how that logic uh, that we could be driven by motives of which we're unaware or this, this notion that people are not fully transparent to themselves and that sometimes they have beliefs or practices that when you'd ask them, why do you have this belief? Why do you have this practice? They would say X or Y or Z, but there are other motives. There are other reasons. I don't want to call them causes, but there are other dynamics at play than that person's conscious not mind seems to want to recognize. Now, okay, I think... One of the great traditions that grew out of psychoanalysis is the existential psychoanalysis. So like the existentialists kind of merge together. And it's really interesting because, you know, in some way, Freud and Sartre are, are at odds in that Sartre kind of denies, you know, I guess explicitly denies an unconscious. And it, it makes it so that Freud is at first pass, maybe a more of a difficult merger. But the there's so many ways in which they do come together or it's maybe again not explicitly Sartre although Sartre does do work in existential psychoanalysis and existential psychology but it had to do with this this realization of death fear this sense in which people have senses of self-worth that are driving the need for self-esteem that, that you know that are driving some of their activities and their other otherwise you know, things that can be attributed to th something like personality or to disposition. And, you know, I think some of those things, yeah, could those be seen as expressions of genetic uh, inheritance to a range? It's not to deny any of that. But I think for the existential psychoanalysis, uh, for the analysts, so much of it had to do with how people struggled with their life's meaning and how things like anxiety and depression, they're, they're not simply directly the result of a biochemical problem. Now, it might be indirectly that, but it has to do with senses of is one meaningfully engaged in the world? Has one come to terms with one's own death and how has one either failed or not failed life's call upon many projects? You know, there, there are so many people around us who in some way make calls upon us. And the question is, how well are we responding to those? Now, I think, as I, I had hinted, please go see that Sheldon Solomon uh, interview. It's just so fascinating. Because one of the people who I do think really picked up uh, Freud's work and, and the psychoanalytic tradition so well was Ernest Becker. Yeah, no, it, so the mature trilogy of Becker is the second edition of the birth and death of meaning and then denial of death and then escape from evil. But now this in this second edition of the birth and death of meaning, Becker, he lays out what he calls psychoanalytic characterology. Yeah, psychoanalytic characterology. And by, by that expression, what, what Becker is saying is that yes, People need some sort of psychoanalysis. They need some sort of psychoanalytic orientation to realize that they're, they're motivated by factors of which they're largely unaware or that they're repressing and that they, they may need to think again or to reconsider perhaps what, what their motives are. And to try to gain increasing uh, degrees of self-understanding. But where he really disagreed, I think, with Freud was that where Freud had a tendency to put it into the sex drive and the death drive, right? The Eros and Thanatos. What, what Becker did is he said, no, what's happening is that organisms who are complex enough to become self-aware, they need self-esteem or some kind of continued sense of self-esteem in order to buffer off the anxiety and not have action bogged down. That the demand for self-conscious action is self-worth, belief that one matters more than, you know, a, a, a potato or a grasshopper or just some 
thing in the world that one's life, you know, it's like, again, like self-aware organisms, they bear a struggle with action if they feel like they're worthless or their, their life doesn't have any purpose or there's they're irrelevant. And so, so much of culture then for, for Becker is a kind of disguised system for people to create and maintain a sense of self-worth. So, you know, everything from religious beliefs to socioeconomic classes and statuses to the belief that one is important if one has a, a better paying job than another person uh, to the, you know, the, the sort of hierarchies by which we evaluate self-worth, right? Those become drenched with symbolic and like ritualistic dimensions. You know, one of the people who was really influential on Becker was Norman O. Brown in his book, Life Against Death. I think it's subtitled The Psychoanalytic Meaning of History, where, you know, he starts to realize that, you know, entire cultures could be looked at through this, this psychoanalytic lens. And we start to see, by the time you get to Becker's denial of death, Right, I mean, there's Norman O'Brown and Otto Rank that really sobered up Becker. I mean, he started to realize that, okay, so let's get back to this. You know, so imagine the person who thinks that they're a really tough guy. I want to go back to the self-esteem and the, the need for it and then how psychoanalysis reveals that as a, an underlying motive that's maybe being repressed or censored from conscious self-awareness. So, you know, some person, will say a guy thinks of himself as, a, as like a tough guy, a real badass kind of person, and he wears leather and has tattoos and, you know, he says he's like, you know, his, his idea of fun is getting in fights and or, you know, harassing people. And if you would say to the person something along the lines of perhaps this is a kind of character armor that's helping you fend off possible attacks on your self-worth and sense of self-esteem and this is a very elaborate system by which you're gaining your self-esteem is through these various symbols and these kinds of rituals and practices the person probably be oh shut up i'm going to take you out and punch you in the nose so again they, they're not going to want to hear their motives for actually instead i think they want to say you know something along the lines of no you don't understand i am a badass i'm a tough guy you know that's sort of who i am but i think for becker character you know, personalities, they emerge and they grow within these cultural contexts that have, again, rich tapestry of available symbols by which a person enacts that cultural role or that, that cultural character. Whether it's, you know, being the smart person or being the, the funny person or the person who's most polite or the most kind or, again, the, the toughest person in the room, any of those you know, for Becker, they're not just simply expressions of genetic and, you know, it's, it's not just variability in the pool that's ex naturally expressing itself. It's that we're self-conscious organisms caught in socio-historical dynamics, kind of these like ongoing ritualistic dramatic situations. And we, when we're young, we learn how to wear certain ones and we realize that certain performances gain hugs and appreciation and others really people don't pay attention to us. And we start to grow and cultivate a sense of self that it's it seems like it's what we like and it's who we are. And in some sense, we may just take ourselves naturally to quote, be a way. But for, for Becker, it's they're disguised routes of self-esteem uh, pursuit and, and maintenance. And then he starts to say, you know, what's so treacherous about this is that the need for self-worth, it can grow to astronomical magnitudes. It's, it almost has, it can go unchecked and it, it has this, you know, this tendency to, to inflate even to cosmic proportions. And he starts to talk about, you know, issues like religious worldviews where people can, they, they get an ultimate sense of worth and value as if, you know, they're made in the image of a divine creator who's perfect. And there's all these kinds of other ways that religious dogma become disguised routes in which an organism who is fearing death. And see, this is where he, so he gets the denial of death, right? And I mean, Becker starts to, he starts to realize that the need for self-esteem goes all the way in down into death denial. And that, 
that, and again, going back to Norman O. Brown's work, right? It's that entire cultures and the entire culture itself is this elaborate drama that's enacted around each cultural member and participants, you know, gain entrance into the culture by, I guess, subscribing to symbols and worldviews and practices that give the sense that one doesn't really die. Whether it's like a, a like an actual immortality, a kind of transcendence beyond one's life, and it's like whether it's kind of Kierkegaardian faith or it's just simply a belief that there is a transcendent realm that one will go to, and there's various religious you know dogma and religious symbolism, iconography, other kinds of things that help people visualize that and enact it and, and share stories with others. Or there are people, they flee from it by pursuit in those things that they think transcend their own death, whether it's having children and trying to pass on uh, cultural practices and genetic material on the next generation, or they, they write books, they make buildings, they make art, they write music, they're scientists who create, you know, uh, vaccines and other, you know, kinds of improvements for people's health. So I think, you know, people try to in some way give into the world that's larger than them. I think one of the unfortunate sides of uh, of people's drive for self-worth and of their death denial is that it, it can take, again, very disguised forms where scapegoating occurs, forms of nationalism, sexism, racism. And what's happening is people... Without, without consciously thinking of themselves as purposefully degrading another in order to feel good about themselves, people end up, for psychological reasons, having, again, like defense mechanisms and forms of ego-gratifying function that make it seem as if other people are somehow more problematic and that they're especially those others who are very, whose practices are very different, whose dietary practices are different, whose sexual practices are very different, who, those who speak a, another language that we're unfamiliar with. You know, The Worm and the Core, it's, it's such a fascinating book. Please go check out that Sheldon Solomon uh, book, uh, it's a really fascinating book, fairly recently came out. But, you know, he talks in there about they had access to some judges which is really rare, I guess, in some psychological studies, you know, to get this kind of access, but they had a good number of judges and they did mortality salience tests in there where, you know, they split the conditions and in one condition, they were, the judges were asked to think about their own mortality in an explicit way, sort of, and it was in it was a stack of a bunch of different files. So they, again, they tried to control for the variance between the situations. But they found that the people who were primed with a mortality salience condition, they were more likely to give harsher sentences to those people who were against their own political beliefs and values and to be more lenient to those who are more similar. And it had to do with like sentencing differences. I think it was for like sex workers or prostitutes, but it really fascinating the way that, you know, forms of of dislike are magnified in against those who we, who we don't like. It gets accentuated and heightened in the mortality salience condition. So as, as people are sort of reminded, not, not, not necessarily consciously, but even like slightly primed or like unconsciously primed of their own death, they have a tendency to polarize, again, to over accentuate their familiarity and or their camaraderie with those who they share views and they again they, they accentuate the need to distance and or to I guess diminish or degrade the the others now one of the people I think who has done a lot of really interesting work in psychology and again it's not exactly the psychoanalytic tradition in the Freudian sense, but it's forms of psycho, uh, I guess, analytic orientation or logic that's just practiced in psychology more generally, right? Because, I mean, Freud was such a founder of psychology that some of his orientation, particularly psychoanalysis, I think just understood as 
you know, the expression that means people can be driven by motives of which they're unaware or people are not really transparent to themselves or that there are ego gratifying functions in their thoughts and beliefs or that there's a kind of censoring that's going on that's preventing some things from conscious awareness being fully appreciated. I mean, all of those kinds of dynamics, I think is what I mean by psychoanalysis or the psychoanalytic orientation. But it's Ellen Langer, you know, Ellen Langer, uh, contemporary psychologist, and she did a, a piece in Communication Monographs, this was maybe in the 90s, where it's called uh, Communication and Mind, no, Language and Mindlessness, Communication and Mindlessness, but it's, it's a really fascinating piece in here where she talks about the way that people without real, again, it's not something that they realize, right? They, they don't really realize it, but they have a tendency to use words in a selective way that reflects their beliefs and values while claiming that they're just being value free and you know perspective free and value neutral that is, they, they don't really have a perspective on things they're just reflecting how things are and they're not in, importing their values they're just again they're talking about the things as they are in the world Again, that's how people sort of think about it, whereas she says, no, in fact, what's going on is people have a tendency to, you know, they take the repertoire, the full palette of avail available options in the language, and then they'll pick nearly synonymous words, but that have different connotations or different meanings. So, for example, if you really like someone, you, you know, you might call them flexible. Oh, you know, you say, well, they're pretty flexible in, in, when you see some bit of behavior. If you don't like them, you say, well, they're unpredictable. They're unpredictable, you know. Or if you like someone, you say, well, they're really reliable. They're really reliable. If you don't like someone, you say, well, they're kind of rigid or they're, they're too predictable. See, I mean, see, and her point is that it's, it, again, it's very similar to what's known as the actor-observer bias. I think some people are aware of this, right? You know, the actor-observer bias in psychology is that we, and it's related to attribution theory, right? it's related to attribution theory, but it's that, which is, you know, we make different attributions for, for people and for ourselves versus others. So when, when good things befall um, us, you know, personally, we have a tendency to attribute the good fortune to something dispositional, to something that we've done. So again, something good happens to me, I get a raise at work, and I say, wow, it's because of all my hard work, and blah, blah, blah. When good things happen to other people, we have a tendency, again, it's like an ego-gratifying, self-censoring function just within consciousness. But that we, we will have a tendency to say, well, they were lucky or, you know, that they, they were, you know, the, the boss has favoritism for them or they were at the right place at the right time. Again, it's something circumstantial. And then we reverse that when it's something negative. So when it's something negative, we say, well, you know, it, when we get in an accident, we say, well, the, you know, it was slippery or, you know, the conditions were bad, something jumped out, a deer hit me, or whatever, and, and I, I didn't have time to react because of the circumstance. Whereas when somebody else gets in an accident, we say, wow, you know, they weren't paying attention, or they're a bad driver, or, or whatever. And I think if you think right now, well, I don't do that, I'd never do that, that's exactly the point of psychoanalysis, that we're not fully transparent to ourselves. And I'm not sure exactly how much we can be you know, that's, that's part of the rub now as we move to this issue, if I can here, to, to, you know, politics and philosophy. You know, I'm not sure the degree to which people can be fully transparent with themselves regarding their motives. I think we, we want to believe that we can be more or less true to ourselves, more or less in uh, denial, you know, I, I, Ronald David Lang, I think he calls it uh, perception coefficient, you know, the degree to which your beliefs align with facts of the matter. And again, this is very tricky when we're talking about beliefs about our own beliefs, or beliefs about what we think. Um, I think, you know, and try to try to get in the issue of politics just as, as, a, as a way maybe into it. And when someone is a Republican or when someone is a Democrat, and it's it's so sad we have this two-party system, you know, if I just reduce it down to that, like you hear the partisan politics, as soon as someone starts speaking, 
you know, during a Senate hearing or whatever, you almost can tell whether it's a Republican or Democrat just by the angle of the questions. It's like they're, they're revealing their own beliefs and their own orientations, worldviews, their values, right? The, you know, the, the question is, again, how much are they aware of what they're doing? Like, people seem to just be in this deep, divisive disagreements. You know, why is that? You know, is it that they think that they're right and the other person is wrong? See, I think that is what's going on. Right? Now... It's one of the interesting things to sort of talk about politics is that I think we, we want to believe, well, if we could all be rational, be reasonable with one another, we could come to some consensus about what's best to do. And yet there seems to be this struggle because if you take something just very simple, like should there be a guaranteed minimum income? Or if you take something like, you know, should there be a welfare system? Should there be no regulation on trade at all? People have very different responses, not only because they have a different slice of the pie that they're seeing and not only because they have, you know, different values and beliefs, but they have ego gratifying defense mechanisms that prevent them from realizing why they hold the beliefs they have. You know, if somebody inherited a lot of money, they may not want to think that they having their political beliefs because they don't want to think about the fact that they've inherited the money. You know, I think a lot of people don't want to think about the fact that their political beliefs are basically shaped, many people, just on what their friends and their family believe. If their friends and their family believe it, they believe it too and they don't think too much about it. And then when they get doggedly asked about what they believe and why they believe it, they get all irritated because they just want to go, mm. and they don't want to say, well, my friends like this person. <laughs> you know, it gets really difficult. I don't know how rational people, how, how they are. You know, and I think this is the same, you know, I was in some of these recent discussions with Matt, you know, Thou Art That, and we were talking about panpsychism and death acceptance and you know I think a lot of the struggles with death acceptance and you know part of my own skepticism or my my the, the psychoanalytic orientations that I've been exposed to they would lead me to question about why some people have the particular afterlife beliefs that they have or even the religious beliefs that they have you know not to say that I am or would self-identify as a a limitativist materialist or someone who can just reduce everything down to what is, quotes, here now. No, I think there are problems of socio-historical issues. There's problems of non-being. You know, I've, I've said I do have a new book coming out. I'm really excited about this book on non-being. But I think that, you know, the questions for for philosophy are huge and for politics. You know, to what extent could people you know, openly begin with why are there obstacles to political discourse? Like from the psychoanalytic orientation, what is it that's making political discourse so difficult? Is it that some people are right and some people are wrong? Is it that some people are more informed and other people are just uninformed? I think we can try to give it that and we can try to go that way. But if we underestimate the degree to which we are also going to have to say something like, people are not just looking at the world, seeing it, and then making, I guess, warranted beliefs from the evidence at hand. I mean, in some way, people are in information silos and the internet and its various social media platforms have isolated people out into self-sustaining little silos of information wind tunnels. And that, that itself is a dynamic. We could talk about that for a while and how we maybe don't realize that. And if, we're point, if that's pointed out to us, we want to say, well, okay, but that's not really what's going on. You know, other people just aren't informed. I think that's, again, that's the ego gratifying defense mechanism that consciousness normally makes. Like, I don't know how much people are really doing their homework while they're viscerally having these beliefs. You know, I think some of it has to do with, you know, even you look at some of the economic issues, you know, when Elizabeth Warren had her two cents on the dollar uh, plan after you get it, what, like 50 million a year, it's two cents on every dollar. You know, 
And, and Bill Gates was like, hey, you know, I think that's a great... I, he was laughing, saying, I'm surprised I'm not, you know, taxed more. But I think the reason some people feel the way they feel about taxes, it's at first they, you know... They have beliefs about something like, well, some people are industrious, some people aren't. And some people, if you give them incentives to be lazy, they will just become lazy. And they have all those those beliefs and they say that's their justification for their belief. And maybe that is in that level of the argument. But if we swing it back around from a psychoanalytic question, we start to ask, yeah, but why did they believe that? See, I think some of it is, and it's not to say that we're all stuck with lacking transparency to ourselves, that we're all stuck kind of, you know, fully mysterious and in need of psychoanalysis. Although I think, you know, a show like Frasier is funny because you do see, quotes, the psychologist who is trained in diagnosing others' problems but fails to see his own with own with his own clarity. And maybe that's why, you know, sometimes we talk with others. You know, others are able to help us see the the shortcomings in our views and maybe the ulterior motives that we wouldn't have entertained for ourselves. Uh, at any rate, I hope all is well and uh, looking forward to seeing people. I think I told people I am. I'm going to try to do some video soon, but I want to get a video. The Hierarchy of Heaven and Earth. People, if you haven't read it by Harding, you know anything about The Headless Way, I'm going to start talking about The Headless Way soon. And especially that book. That's a fascinating book. Okay, hope everyone is well. Take care. Bye.